Our guest today is the Congressman for the 7th Congressional District of Illinois. He was elected to Congress in 1996 and re-elected by large majorities to succeeding Congresses. Prior to his election to Congress, our guest today served for six years on the county board. Previously, he served for 11 years as alderman of the 29th Ward. Our guest today was born in Parkdale, Arkansas, just down the road from President Bill Clinton's hometown. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, Congressman Danny K. Davis. Danny. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, let me thank Jay, first of all, for his great introduction. As a matter of fact, we used to call Parkdale Plum Nelly. And we called it Plum Nelly because it was plum out the county <laughs> and nearly out the state. We were about 10 miles from the Louisiana line going south, and we were about 20 miles from the Mississippi River going east. So we had one great distinction, though, and that is that Scotty Pippen lived about 12 miles from where I lived. And, <laughs> and, and, and so good things could happen <laughs> down there. But let me just thank all of you for being here. Um, let me just add that the City Club, under the leadership of, of Jay and any of you who are interested in public policy, and if you don't read uh, Dr. Paul Green, if you're not aware of some of all the things that take place, the numbers of individuals who sort of come here to get educated, stimulated, motivated, and sometimes even activated. And so it's a real delight for me to have gotten up at 4 o'clock this morning. <laughs> catch an airplane at 6, <laughs> to get here at 7, <laughs> and it only took one solid hour to get from O'Hara down here to be here at 8 o'clock. So it's been a very stimulating morning. <laughs> um, I, I want to also just acknowledge a couple of other people. State Representative LaShawn Ford, who is the youngest state representative uh, in Illinois. Stand up, so they Sean looks so young until oftentimes when he goes to schools, uh, the kids take him to be another student, especially if it's a high school. But he actually got legislation passed his first time uh, out in the Illinois General Assembly, and he's going to help bring Mike Madigan and Emil Jones and the governor and all those folks together, and everything is going to be all right. And uh, so we, we, we're counting on... on um, of course, it's good to be anywhere with my good friend, Alderman Ed Smith. Ed and I sort of grew up together in public life. I've known Ed longer than I have probably anybody in public life in Chicago. Ed and I actually taught school together at the Magellan EVG Center back in the 1960s. He was a math and science teacher, and I was a social studies and language arts teacher. And our kids weren't supposed to make it. As a matter of fact, it was a special school. And quite frequently, I run into one guy who's a millionaire. I know another guy who's got a doctorate's degree. All of these kids were overaged underachievers. As a matter of fact, the first female who got a certificate who was certified to be a drafting teacher, came from our school. And so we were both able to feel pretty good about our experiences as teachers in the Chicago public school system, and we felt that we did all right. We were brand new. All of us at this particular school, I think two people had taught before, we were all rookies. And we just simply went there with a lot of them, bigger, 
We believed that we could teach, and if we could teach, kids could learn. And uh, it was one of the most productive periods of my life. And so, Ed, it's good to see you after 40 years. <laughs> after 40 years. Let me make two disclaimers. One, um, this has been the most productive year of my public life in terms of the ability to move things, make things happen, get things done, pass legislation, pass amendments, shape major bills, knowing that we had the direct impact on having those become what they were. And then to deal with local issues in such a way that we added those to the mainstream of American thought and American life. I am very fortunate and it's good to see Dr. Milton, who runs one of these great institutions that I have the opportunity to represent. I have more colleges and universities, institutions of higher education than you will find practically anywhere in a congressional district in America. The South Loop, for example, has simply become an education mecca. 20 years ago, you never would have thought that that many students would be anchored in the South Loop. Not to take anything away from the other end of town, Loyola, <laughs> and, and, and all of those, but there's a concentration. I also have more hospitals and more hospital beds in my congressional district than any congressional district in America, without a doubt. And then we are fortunate that uh, Mr. Magoon and Children's are going to build and are in the process of building a brand new children's hospital in our district, in the Streeterville community. We were just with them on yesterday when they were before the Illinois Health Facilities Planning Board. And I'm sure that they're going to get the approval to build this new billion dollar hospital. Well, that's a heavy. <laughs> when they were saying how much it was going to cost, I was saying I sure wouldn't want the task of raising the money <laughs> for it. But I'm sure that you'll be able to do it. Let me say a couple of other things. One, I'm an optimistic person. And where there's life, I believe that there is hope. And where there is hope, there is possibility. And where there is possibility, then people rise to the occasion of doing what needs to happen. But I also believe that we are facing one of the most critical periods in the history of our country. To the best of my recollection, every generation in America have always been able to predict that they were going to be better off than the generation before them. All of us grew up with the idea, I don't care where we came from, whether we were black, white, green, purple, yellow, gold, polka dot, I really don't care if we came from middle class families, or lower socioeconomic groups, we all grew up with the idea that the quality of our lives was going to be better than that of the generation before us. There was never a doubt in my mind as to whether or not I was going to be better off than my mother and father, or better off than my grandparents. I am not convinced that children growing up in America today can predict with any high degree of certainty that life for them is going to be better than it is for us. Young people are graduating from colleges and universities and driving taxis. Individuals are walking the streets looking for jobs. I get resumes of people with master's degrees across my desk every day saying that they can't find a job. 
can you help me get into, and I tell them, well, government is not like it used to be. <laughs> there are no bloated governments anymore the way governments used to be. And so things are not really good. In spite of the president suggesting that the economy is still strong, I was in Waterloo, Iowa on Saturday campaigning for my favorite candidate for president, Barack Obama. And after we had gone to this rally, we all got walk sheets because they know that those of us in Chicago who do serious politics used to do a lot of door knocking, <laughs> you know. We call that troop strength where you go out and engage people. And so they gave us all walk sheets and told us which communities to go in. And I said to myself, they must have given me <laughs> the most difficult streets because every other house that I went to was foreclosed, boarded up, and every other house on the streets where I went were boarded up. Uh, people were not looking very good when we would manage to find somebody at home. Uh, there were abandoned cars in the yard. There was debris that had not been moved. As a matter of fact, in many instances, the snow had not been shoveled, and you couldn't get to the house. And so it really meant that people had sort of lost hope, and in many ways had sort of given up. People who don't shovel the snow from in front of their homes, it's often because they don't feel that it makes any difference whether they do or they don't. And so America is in serious need, I think, of changing its direction. I am convinced that as long as we continue to spend more than $12 billion fighting a war every month in one place, that we're not going to have the resources that are needed for the domestic activity that we must have in order to change conditions. So it really means that the American people, rather than being lethargic, must become more engaged, must become more involved, must become more proactive. Unfortunately, many people, because we're in a high-tech communication age, Many people sort of sit home and feel that they can get what they need from television, or they can read the journalists, or they can listen to the commentators, and that's quite good. We have elections where less than 50% of the people vote in what we call the world's greatest democracy. And yet less than 50% of the people participate in terms of saying, let's decide which way we go. You see, I believe that there are basically two kind of people in the world. There are those who shape and mold society. And there are those who are shaped and molded by society. And I think all of us have to ask ourselves the question, am I a molder or am I a moldy? Meaning that if I am a molder, then I want to help shape and mold. If I'm a moldy, then I'm content to be shaped and molded. I'm content to kind of fit in where somebody else and some other things decide that is where I should be. And so no matter where I am, what I do, I'm always promoting that people really should be involved that people really should be engaged, that people should find some cause that they believe enough in to become a part of trying to change things from what they are to what they think they ought to be. When I 
see Terry Mason, and then I see Steve Martin, who is also the uh, director, Dr. Steve Martin, of public health for the county. And then I think of when Eric Quitaker was the director of public health for the state of Illinois, the Illinois Department of Public Health. Some of us who are not afraid to be proud of our ethnic heritage <laughs> were just very delighted that there were three African-American males who were the top health officials public in each level of the state. And one of the reasons I say that is because if you look at what's happening with African-American males in America, it is scary. Illinois, African-American males make up 6% of the state's population, but 60% of the state's prison population. African-Americans, for example, in this country make up 13 to 14% of the population, you know, you go for the undercount and the difficulty of counting people, but more than 50% of all the people who are incarcerated in this country are African American males. The fastest growing part of the prison population in America are young African American women. The fastest group that is becoming imprisoned and yet, notwithstanding these disparities, we've still been able to see some things happening, see some things take place, know that there is some progress being made in some areas. We were able to pass two weeks ago a bill that some of us had been working on for four or five years. There aren't really a lot of people, and I think LaShawn can tell you that, and I think Ed Smith can tell you that, and I agree that Ed is to be commended for passing a substantive piece of legislation in the Chicago City Council, the no smoking ordinance. Most things that individuals pass in the City Council and other places are ordinances to name streets. and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you kind of the way it is. Uh, uh, honorary resolutions and, you know, things in the legislature to say you're a good guy when you die or so-and-so did some great work. But to pass substantive legislation, I mean, that's a real deal in legislative bodies and especially legislation that is not simply reauthorizing something that already existed. And that's one of the reasons that we are so proud of the Second Chance Act that we passed a little more than two weeks ago. It was groundbreaking <laughs> legislation. And, and just yesterday, the technical amendments got taken care of that needed to happen and we're pretty confident that the Senate now is going to wrap that up, hopefully today or tomorrow, and we can send it on to the President's desk to be signed. Well, I'm very proud of that because most of this was done while my political group was in the minority. We were not in the majority. I serve on the Education Committee, and the reason that I say that it's been such a great year is because we have passed the greatest aid to higher education that has been passed in this country since the GI Bill. Since the GI Bill, a Democratic Congress passed that legislation president threatened to veto it, but finally he got around to deciding that he would not veto it. And as a result of that legislation, some of it are things that I had a direct influence on and was able to have one amendment that actually raised the Pell Grant by $900 million. That, that increased the Pell Grant. 
Well, students who go to college, I mean, we also reduce the interest rates for student loans in half. Students who go to college over a four-year period will probably see their Pell Grant allocation increase in some instances as much as $5,000. That's what it will mean to the individual student. I've been very engaged in child welfare kinds of things and work very closely with Hillary Clinton and Olympia Snow and uh, Senator Landro from uh, Louisiana in something called the Adoption Caucus, where we all kind of push how do you deal with children who are wards of the state. And we've been able to push some concepts there suggesting that just because individuals may care for foster children and they are related, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily wealthy. We call that kinship care. And that kinship care providers ought to get some additional money. The war has loomed high. And uh, of course, I'm pleased that early on, I was one of those individuals who suggested that we really didn't have enough information, that we really didn't have justification to invade Iraq. Lots of other people have come around since then. And I also tell people that Barack Obama was at that level early on. And of course, some of the other candidates for president have reached that point now. But fortunately for Barack, he was there early on with that position. We will probably take a vote when I get back, either later on today or tomorrow, to fund the war in Iraq. And unless something changes between the time that I leave and get back, I doubt very seriously if I'm going to vote for it. I mean, sometimes you get a little arm twisting and all those kind of things go on in terms of your group and your party. Many of us in Chicago kind of grew up as what we call political independents. But I can tell you that doing politics in a legislative body is kind of like playing football. There aren't many quarterbacks that uh, run out there by themselves and, and forget about the line. <laughs> I, I mean, you generally go with the group. Because, first of all, you want to be a part of the group, and you also need the protection of the group. In spite of all the, 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 the discrepancies that continue to exist in American life, it's hard not to suggest that our country has made a tremendous amount of progress, lots of it. As a matter of fact, sometimes I reflect back to when the Constitution was being written and when the preamble was put together and the guys kind of sat around the table and said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, there weren't any women there and they didn't have women in mind at the moment. They really didn't. And when they got around to counting black people, they decided that black people could be counted, but it's three-fifths of a person uh, for census purposes. And you know, you got to work out these agreements in terms of how many people you're going to have as representatives in the House and the Senate. That was called the three-fifth compromise. And here we are today when it looks as though either a woman or an African-American may be elected president of the United States of America. It's hard to suggest that even as police profiling continues <laughs> that we haven't made some progress. I, I mean, it's hard to suggest 
when we talk about the perfection of a union, to form a more perfect union, didn't mean that the union was perfect at that time, but the idea was to set the stage for the continuous development and the continuous formation of a union that becomes more inclusive, provides more opportunity, provides more equality, and operates with a sense of justice, spelled J-U-S-T-I-C-E, and not like when you go to the traffic court, all that you see is J-U-S-T dash U-S, just us. <laughs> And so it is a pleasure to be here this morning. And I think I'll stop at that point and entertain some interaction. And I'm sure anything else that I might have said, I can say it uh, through that. So thank you all very much. And why don't I? Uh, Good morning, morning, Congressman. Good uh, morning, Anthony. It's excellent to have you out this morning. It's inspirational, encouraging. I want to thank you uh, personally for your efforts with the, and successful efforts with the uh, Second Chance Act, helping ex-offenders come out and uh, get employment, recover from the alcohol and drug abuse, what have you. I am a member of the City Club Board of Governors and also Vice President of the Haymarket Center. But one of the issues that, uh, aside from that, that continue to, uh, I find worrisome here in the state, and I just want to get your opinion about it, is the disparity around funding uh, here for education. The way I understand that the current system is that uh, property taxes are major uh, supplements to, to education here in terms of funding. And what you end up with is a uh, situation where because you live in an area with higher property taxes, you have more resources for a particular school versus an area with low property taxes. And to me, that perpetuates classism in, in, this, in this state. And that is not something that I find that I can approve of. So I just wonder, do you, do you believe that we can get to a point in this state where we provide more public funding to, to better equalize and bring on parity funding across the state? I do, as a matter of fact. Um we find in the state of Illinois, per pupil expenditures range from one third in some instances to one half. Some school districts can spend as much as $16,000 a year per pupil. You'll find others spending $6,000 per year per pupil. It's hard to be equal and that's something that we wrestle with when we deal with No Child Left Behind, which is legislation that we're getting ready to really tackle in a serious way. I happen to agree with those who believe that increasing the state income tax would be a better way of funding public education for the state of Illinois. It's hard to understand how a state that in so many ways has been progressive has been so far behind in terms of its, its, its assistance to public education. We're right down near the bottom relative to what we put in. And so I believe that if we were to not rely upon real estate taxes, but rely upon a state income tax that kind of touched each person based upon what they earn that this would be a better way of funding education and we could reach a different level of parity and a different level of equity. I mean, I've got some of the best schools in my congressional district in the nation, but I also have some of the poorest performing schools. I mean, I've got schools like St. Ignatius Prep, like Oak Park River Forest High School, like Trinity Lutheran, like uh, Paul Adams' uh, little school out on the west side where they sent everybody to college, Providence, St. Mel. But we've got other schools that are way down. And I think that, yes, there's a great deal of change needed in terms of the way 
We also need more federal assistance, too, for education. But you can't get federal assistance if you have an administration that decides that rich people don't have to pay a fair share in terms of taxes. And when you give tax breaks to the wealthiest 1% of the population using the old trickle-down theory of economics, the idea being that if you help those at the top, they're going to reinvest and something's going to trickle down. And I always take the position that when my mother wanted to make a soup or a stew, and she would throw all of the stuff in there that you put in in a big pot, and when she got ready to stir it, she'd go all the way down to the bottom and kind of stir up things from the bottom, meaning that if you provide some more resources to the people at the bottom, that is, continue to raise the minimum wage where it becomes a livable wage, change the way we had a hearing the other day trying to figure out how to keep corporate executives from making so much money. <laughs> I don't, I, I, obviously we didn't arrive at any conclusion, but you know, it's, it's amazing when you see one person in a company who earns 600 times as much as the average worker in that country or when people get paid so much money they can't figure out what to do with it. And, uh, and others are, are just barely struggling trying to make it. Well, if you put some more money in the pockets of the people at the bottom, you already know what they're going to do with it. They're going to spend it. And they're going to plow it right back into the economy. They're going to buy milk and bread and pampers, and diapers, and toys, all of the consumer things that the masses use. And so I think if you help the people at the bottom first, that that's going to help stabilize the economy. We also got another problem, though, and I really didn't mention, and that is the problem of globalization. Big problem, and we have not yet figured out just how to handle it nor have we figured out what to do about the question of immigration. I mean, those are two big centerpiece issues that we are wrestling with as a nation. And I think that those are two that you've got to bring to a head. We've got to decide how we're going to handle those. Otherwise, I think our problems are going to continue to exist. Yes. Um, good morning, Congressman Davis. Jacqueline Carr, Diversity Healthcare. One of the things that uh, healthcare obviously is always an issue. Are you seeing that there's more funding going into women's health at the federal level? Because in D.C. alone, they've got an, the newest cases of AIDS is African American teenage girls at 70 percent in some districts in D.C. Uh, from 14 to 18, and we're looking at health at the adult level of African American women all the way down to these young high, these young girls at 14 and 17. We got this. Next level, HIV, uh, AIDS, a group, 70% is just tremendous in D.C., and I'm not hearing much discussion on capital about AIDS and young African-American girls. Thank you. Well, there's a great deal of discussion. As a matter of fact, the Congressional Black Caucus has had that as a centerpiece of our activity, and we think that we've made a tremendous amount of progress relative to increasing the funding both nationally and internationally relative to what our government is providing. But again, if you're spending all of this money on the war, I mean, that's a lot of money. And you're not figuring out how to acquire more money in terms of taxation and a fair way to do it. You can't get blood out of a turnip. And so if the money is not there, the state of Illinois, though, has had a very aggressive program. And I give the state a great deal of credit because we've been a big part of that coalition. The city of Chicago, we've worked closely with the Chicago Department of Public Health, 
with Dr. Mason and his staff, the county, and the state. As a matter of fact, World AIDS Day was just a couple of weeks ago, and we just had a whole week of activity that, that all of us were engaged in. The Illinois Department of Public Health has small grants that they provide to local community groups to go out and do AIDS education. I've been working with a group of people. We actually go out on Sunday afternoons to churches after they get through with service and do AIDS education. Sometimes we buy the church kitchen out so we can make sure we keep people there and says, uh, you know, anybody want to eat, just come on down to the lunchroom. We've bought all the chicken, and, <laughs> and we get people having dinner. It's wonderful, though. I mean, and, and, and what has been so wonderful is the receptivity of groups that people thought would not have serious discussions about these issues. The last one that I did was out on King Drive at uh, Mount Pisgah. And uh, we must have had about 150 uh, solid citizen types. Because I must confess that a lot of young people aren't going to church, um, especially young African-American males <laughs> are not going to church. But there are a lot of efforts underway. The money, no, we do not have as much money as we need. And we're not putting as much money in as we need to put in. But until we change some things, we're just not going to have the money to do it. Congressman Davis, Frank Williams, uh, past president of our local Realtor Association, as well as past president of Chicago Association of Realtors, and certainly your beautiful wife and I both have been past presidents of the NACP. You spoke about foreclosures in Waterloo, Iowa. That is a problem throughout our country, naturally. And I'm wondering to what extent and to what level is our Congress actually pushing forward to show a greater response of redress to those who've been caught up in uh, this whole mirage that we're dealing with today? Well, you know, the President has just come up with a program that we think is going to help about 15% of those individuals who are facing foreclosure. What this program does is it, it freezes the interest rates for a certain period of time for those individuals who purchased property and got mortgages between one date and another date. Of course, that's only going to help so many people. There are a number of bills that are in the House that's designed to do all kinds of different things. The idea is that, and we just had on uh, Sunday, we had something called Foreclosure Sunday, where we were able to get a large number of churches to get involved. Alderman Smith and I were at the St. John Holiness Church on Sunday, and we had a great event there. State Representative LaShawn Ford heads up a task force that we've created uh, to deal with the foreclosure issue. Some of the ideas, and he actually has a bill in the General Assembly that, that, that he's pushing. Some of the ideas, though, that we've come up with that we think will be helpful is to, one, have a solid moratorium on foreclosure. Some people think that's far-fetched and way out. There are some institutions, banks and savings and loans in California that have already agreed and are in fact doing this. And what we're saying is that if you have a 90-day moratorium saying that we're not going to foreclose at least in 90 days for these individuals, maybe something will happen relative to their economic state that will allow them to refocus their mortgage or be able to catch up or do something. Maybe not, but you haven't lost anything. Plus, when you foreclose, especially in certain type communities, 
two weeks after people move out, the property is destroyed. I'm saying vandals will have broken in and taken everything that is not nailed down. And, and so the mortgage holder loses. The person who had put money and built up a little equity in the property, they lose, so everybody loses. That's one idea we've been pushing. We've been pushing another one, and we've just about got our legislation ready to introduce, that suggests that in some instances, individuals ought to be allowed to actually rent the property that they're in for a specified period of time to see whether or not they're going to be able to be back on track where they can pay the mortgage. Once again, the property is being maintained. People are still there. Their lives have not been totally disrupted. I think all of us kind of know how we got to this point relative to the crisis in terms of subprime loans and in terms of people saying, well, you know, we can sell you a house, no money down. We can sell you a house even though you only make $35,000 a year. We're going to sell you a $200,000 house. Or people have come along in some instances and inflated and actually had assessments made that were way out of line relative to, to the actual value. Uh, all kinds of legislation. I'd like to see some of these people um, <laughs> arrested, <laughs> uh, charged, <laughs> criminalized, and quite frankly, put in jail for preying upon unsuspecting consumers knowing full well that that's what they were doing. So there are a lot of approaches out there relative to what's going to help, but what's probably being implemented the most at the moment is the idea of freezing the interest rates on those loans that are designed to go up in the next few months. I mean, that's what's happening more than anything else right now. Yes. Hi, my name is Joy Shanahan. I'm with the Industrial Council of Near West Chicago, which is on the Near West side. And we represent a couple of thousand companies, manufacturers and commercial companies. Our, one of our biggest issues recently has been the U.S. Postal Service. And I know your office has been doing great things to try and get Chicago's uh, Postal Service improved. And I was just wondering if you can give us an update on where things are at with the restructuring and so forth. Well, let me just mention that the Postal Service is one of those complex organizations in our society. First of all, it is a private corporation. It is not subsidized by the federal government. The Postal Service was reorganized in 1970 with a mandate that they be self-sufficient, meaning that they've got to be able to generate the resources that they need in order to function. At the same time, we have certain principles that we've determined to be important one is six-day delivery. Another one is that every person can be able to receive or send a first-class piece of mail for 41 cents. And so even if you live up the mountain, you are supposed to be able to get a first-class piece of mail delivered to your box along the side of the road where it may take a carrier an hour to get to your house from the next closest house. And so we have some serious problems and serious challenges facing the postal service. Notwithstanding that, the city of Chicago went through a period where it had a very effective postmaster, a fellow named Rufus Porter. And Rufus ended up retiring, and then they got a number of postmasters to come through who were not nearly as effective and who didn't listen to those of us who tried to tell them ways that they could better operate. One of the reasons that Rufus Porter was as effective as he was is because Rufus was engaged with the community. 
and had advisory committees at every postal substation where people would come in, where they would have programs and activity. And every time a new station manager was hired, people in the community would be invited to come and meet the station manager. And I must have given more station manager speeches when Rufus was the postmaster. And, and one of the reasons is that the subcommittee that I chair has jurisdiction over the federal workforce, that is the 1.3 million people who work for the federal government. The postal service, meaning the 700,000 postal service employees, and the District of Columbia. That's the subcommittee that I chair. And so obviously I get calls from people all over the country about their post office in Keokuk, Iowa, uh, Podunk, Missouri, uh, whatever. We are improving. We have some big issues relative to contracting out. Uh, the postal service itself wants to uh, privatize a great deal of its service. Of course, the postal unions are opposed to that and don't want to see that happen at all. Hopefully, we're going to be able to work things out where you get the kind of service that you deserve and need without going to the point of talking about subsidizing the postal service. Most people are afraid to kind of mention the idea of subsidizing the postal service, but we still want universal service and we want six-day delivery. So it is a challenge. Any other questions? Again, I'm Joyce Saxon on the Board of Governors of City Club. Arnie Duncan, the head of the Board of Education, has been here several times, and I always ask him the same question, and I don't like the answer. He says that the average low uh, allocation per student in Chicago is 6,000. Then he points out that New York is 8,000. And I ask Arnie, well, do they test better in New York? And if so, how much better? We all know that eight is better than six, right? And he says he can't, uh, he can't give an answer or define it because every state has different tests. Is there anything Congress can do to make a universal test so we could then have a better case for getting more money? Well, much, many of the trends in education is sort of away from testing as the primary measurement for achievement. As a matter of fact, one of the things that people criticized No Child Left Behind for is they felt that there was too much reliance on testing to determine whether or not progress was being made. I agree with many of the theories that people talk about, and I certainly agree that there is a tremendous need for additional money. But in terms of low-income communities and low-income people, I kind of think I know about as much about them as anybody I've ever encountered. And I say that because I've spent all of my life either being a part of those groups, studying those groups, or interacting with those groups. As Jay said, I did grow up in rural America went to a one-room school that was not as big as this room. One woman, Miss Beattie King, taught eight grades, plus the little primer, and what we call the big primer, all by herself. We never went to school where I lived, when I lived there, more than five months a year. They really didn't have a high school for African Americans until just a few years. As a matter of fact, my cousin, when he graduated from high school, he was the only person in his graduating class. <laughs> we were graduating from sixth grade, and he was graduating from 12th grade. Aubrey is now a very wealthy man. 
um, because he just learned some things and he's done those things. But I am convinced that in order to seriously increase school achievement, especially in low-income communities, that you must sell education to the community as the sine qua non for advancement. That, that, that you must convince the people. You must convince the parents, as well as the children, that education is their way out of whatever the situation that they think they are in. Now, I've spoken with Ernie Duncan a number of times and presidents of school boards and other people suggesting that there are ways that you do this. And it's not really something that is original with me. It just happened that when I was in graduate school, I read about an experiment in the Banneker School District in St. Louis, Missouri, where the superintendent, it was the lowest performing district in the city, worst schools, slums, kids, all of the problems. And Dr. Shepard became sort of the Pied Piper of education. And he went around and challenged everybody in the community. He would go in the pool rooms in the evening and shoot pool with the guys and engage them in conversation about why weren't they at home helping their children with their homework. He'd go to the churches on Sunday and talk to the preachers and say, why aren't you telling your kids about going to school and reading? And why don't you have after church things where they can learn to read the Bible? or whatever, and when he got through, that school district came up to being one of the best performing districts. I was so impressed with him that he, when he died, he was out in the Crestwood uh, nursing home, and I happened to be reading the obituary. I mean, I'm an avid reader, and I often tell kids that if you want to do something, learn how to read and once you learn to read and like it then you can go in a direction that you want to go in so i'm a part of all kind of reading kinds of things just read i learned to read the bible as a matter of fact genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy joshua judges ruth we didn't have books but my folks pushed reading my dad had finished the fourth grade. My mother finished the eighth grade. But they were avid readers. And they pushed reading, read, read, read. I think we've got to get kids back to reading. It is true that we have lots of ways of getting information. You know, you can click on the television. You can deal with all kind of technology. But if you never learn to read, it's going to be very difficult to excel academically. And, and so I think that there are ways to get communities involved. And if school boards would take the initiative and school districts to do that, then I think we could see great improvement. Reading scores will go up. Young people will be engaged. Parents will be engaged. Many of the kids don't read because their parents can't read. I have a theory about pushing for the, the notion of getting African-American males to teach early childhood education because the average African-American male in an inner city community have never seen a black man reading or doing anything that relates to education when they go to school, I know one school, they have one African-American male at the whole school. It's a K-6 to six school. And of course, the boys grow up with the idea that education is for women and girls. And so I've passed some legislation that is designed to help
create African American and Latino male teachers for early childhood education and for elementary school with the idea that this is going to help. So I think all of those things are, are part of the equation. All of those things can help. And I end by saying that again, where there is life, <laughs> there is hope. And all of us can in some way, shape, form, or fashion contribute to the further development of our country and life can really become for all of us whatever it is that we would endeavor to make life be. Miss Beatty used a lot of limericks and things like that to teach and she taught us this little saying. It says, I bargained with life for a penny and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening time when I counted my scanty store. But life is a just employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, then you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismay. Whatever price I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And good to be here. Thank you.